Hello one and all, it's your boy Matt. Hope you're having a wonderful day, staying safe in all this craziness that is going on right now. Please folks, we'll get through this, we will, I promise you, stay upbeat, stay positive. We will fight along with this, we will beat this enemy that we have against us right now with this, uh, you know, pandemic that is going on. So please look out for one another, stay safe, do what you need to do to protect you and your loved ones. But to give you a little bit of background and to have some fun in regards to armored fighting vehicles today, we're going to talk about the T-64 main battle tank. Now I am for one always mixing up tanks. I do it all the time. I'm supposed to be someone who knows quite a bit about military equipment, especially tanks, and I do make the mistake. In fact, recently I did uh, make a video of the T-72 uh, cross T-64 auto-loading uh, empty shell casing landing on a troop's head. If you want to go check that video out, you can in uh, the link right here. But we are talking about the T-64 specifically today, and I always get confused with the T-64 and T-72 because they're fairly similar looking when you look at them from the front. And, you know, a lot of people, when they look at older Russian and tanks they all just kind of look the same with a dome like turret uh, low profile vehicle but the t64 was quite unique now when we're looking at tanks from the 1960s and 1970s there can only be one correct conclusion drawn from the vehicles of that era the soviet tanks were completely superior to nato ones during those decades it's just true to say in those times folks between the 60s and 70s nato was totally outmatched for tanks this conclusion naturally disregards things such as crew training levels and morale, but the Soviet war machines of that time were ahead of NATO ones. I'm sorry, but they were. They were doing very well for themselves. The technology they were pushing into the tanks and the capabilities that they had on paper were very, very good. Now, the T-64 series is pretty much the ultimate embodiment of this superiority at the time. Now, the Object 432 development, the project name of the T-64 before it was officially accepted into service, was based on the Object 430 project that had been terminated in 1961. The termination was a result of the Object 430 not being a significant enough improvement over the beautiful T-55 medium tank, and as such, the tank designers of the plant in Kharkov had to come up with something better. And trust me, they did. The development of the Object 432 started in May of 1961 in the KB-60 Design Bureau, and the first actual prototype was ready in September of 1962, between March and September, which was various partial prototypes and mock-ups were well tested at this time. The vehicle generally resembled the Object 430 visually, but there was one significant change. The Object 432 would be the first Soviet tank to use composite armour. The Soviets were well aware of the high explosive anti-tank or heat shell potential from NATO. The problem was that the enemy had them too and the crews had to be protected against them. Additionally, at the time, there was the British L7 105mm rifled gun and the Soviets were well aware of it. Simply put, the new tank's protection levels had to be upgraded to meet these new threats. Despite these considerable challenges though, the Kharkov engineers came out of the entire program with flying colours. What they designed was relatively light, compact tank with state-of-the-art armor for the time. The Object 432 weighed 35 tons and had a crew of three men, commander, gunner, and driver. There was no loader because obviously the gun was loaded automatically, but we'll get to that later. First, let's take a look at the vehicle's protection levels. As I mentioned before, frontal armor of both the hull and turret was composite. What that means is it's consisted of layers of different materials, combined to provide as much protection as possible while keeping the weight limited so that the tank, still classified as a medium tank at the time, not a main battle tank, wouldn't become too heavy. It was very common back then, on all Soviet tanks, and even today somewhat, that the upper frontal plate was sloped about 22 degrees angle from the horizontal, and consisted of the following layers. 80mm of armour steel, 105mm of texalite, and 20 further millimetres of armour steel. The front of the turret was composite as well, featuring an aluminum alloy inlay roughly as such. 120 millimetres of armour steel, 300 millimetres of aluminum alloy, and 190 millimetres of steel armour. The alloy inlay and the steel armour were not distributed evenly, instead most of it was concentrated at the front of the vehicle, resulting in excellent protection levels for its time. According to some of the Soviet data, the vehicle was impervious to all types of NATO 105mm rifled gun shells frontally, specifically 20 degrees to each side of the vehicle's axis. However, in order to keep the weight low, the rest of the tank really wasn't protected as well. Only the front of the vehicle had composite armour, specifically the upper frontal plate and the turret itself. The rest was armoured as such. 
The whole lower frontal plate was 80 millimeters of steel. The whole sides, 80 millimeters or 56 millimeters potentially by the road wheels. Hull rear was 50 millimeters. Hull top, 16 millimeters. Hull bottom, 20 millimeters, and turret rear and turret sides, 65 millimeters. The turret roof, 45 millimeters. Still though, when you compare it to the tanks that it would face back in 1964, it was a huge leap forward as the Centurions in the M48 or M60 series were nowhere near protected enough to withstand its firepower, as the Israelis had learned the hard way during the Yom Kippur War. At the time, the T-62 used the same calibre gun, 150mm smoothbore. It was the same as the Object 432, but the gun was actually different. The T-62 used a gun called the 2A20, or the U-5TS Molot. The Object 432 used another gun derived from it called the 2A21 or D68. The 2A20 was generally a very effective weapon, the shells of which would literally punch through Israeli tank turrets on the exit of the other side. The gun was fully stabilised using the 2E18 Siren stabilised system and the gunner aimed it with the TPD-43 gun sights and range finding system or the TPN-1 sights for firing at night. Its maximum elevation was plus 14 degrees and its maximum depression was minus 6 degrees. Like I mentioned before, the gun was fully automatically loaded by an electrolytic hydraulic mechanism which was another new feature at the time. The main difference between the 2A20 and the 2A21 guns was that the Object 432 gun used a two-piece shell in order to make the automatic loading mechanism work. Contrary to popular belief, the automatic loading of the T-64 series worked completely differently than on the T-72, which is a mistake which I clearly made when I was actually making my video as I mentioned before, which you can go check out. The rounds of the gun consisted of two parts, the shell itself and the charge, and there was a carousel below the turret where both components were stored. In a T-72, the charge is stored horizontally above the shell and the automatic mechanism rams first the shell and then the charge into the barrel. In a T-64, the charges are also stored above the shells, but vertically and in the loading mechanism loads both components at the exact same time. The solution was basically a reaction to the 115mm shell size and its rate of fire in the T-62 tank, which was about 4-5 to five rounds per minute. Much less when the tank was moving, however, the loader just wasn't as skilled. This automatic system along with the split shell increased the gun's rate of fire from 8 to 9 rounds per minute. The tank carried around 40 rounds, 30 of which were preloaded in the automatic loader. The following rounds were used on the T-64. The 3V BM1 subcaliber round penetrating 250mm of rolled homogenous armour at 1000m at 0 degrees or 135mm at 60 degrees from vertical. There's also the 3V B4K heat round penetrating 450mm of rolled homogenous armour at any distance for modernised 3BK8M shells. There's also the 3V 0F18 HE round, which is just a standard high explosive fragmentation round. The subcaliber round could be fired accurately at 4000 meters. the other two rounds at roughly 3300 meters. The Object 432 was powered by a rather interesting power plant. The 5 TDF 13.5 5 cylinder opposite piston two stroke engine producing 700 horsepower, paired with a mechanical planetary transmission with 5 forward gears and 1 reverse gear, allowing the tank to go as fast as 65 km an hour at 35 tons, although speeds normally of around 30 to 40 km an hour were more common. The engine was extremely light and compact thanks to its unusual design, the entire engine weighed a little over a ton. But it was also relatively unreliable, difficult to start in the winter and produced a ton of heat making the tank very visible to the IR spectrum. The power plant remained a signature feature for the Kharkov T-64 tank series and other Soviet tanks used more conventional engines. The vehicle used an individual torsion bar suspension system and can be recognised in difference from the T-72 series at first glance by its typical small road wheels. The really interesting part on which was the fact that the tank did not have the road wheel offset of the typical torsion bar tank suspension designs. That was because the torsion bars were not covering the entire width of the vehicle. Instead, they only reached the middle, which prone to them being quite susceptible to snapping and torsion bars need as much distance as possible and as much meat to them as possible to stop them from breaking. Additional protective measures included an MBC protection system, an automatic fire extinguisher, a smoke generator which basically allowed injection of fuel onto the exhaust system which we see still on tanks today, 
and from many other innovative features the tank was indeed a very advanced and therefore very expensive tank for the time. Three prototypes in total were built until December 1962 and were thoroughly tested until March 1963. The trials went well and the Meshelev plant received an order to get ready for mass production of this tank. The first mass produced vehicles were built between November 1963 and July of 1964 and the tank was officially accepted into service on the 30th of December 1966 under the designation of the T-64. When it comes to production, finding the actual current number is very problematic as various sources claim various different things. The production likely ran from the late 1960s to 1968. The actual number of vehicles produced also varies though. Sources range from approximately 1,200 to as many as 2,000 of these tanks. Throughout the production, the tank was constantly modernised and its teething problems and flaws were fixed by around 1965. For example, the Soviet anti-tank heat side shields that were extended in combat were installed, although few units bothered to do so during training. The shields tended to get stuck on things and they got damaged etc so they just removed them, which is why you see f such few images of the tanks with those shields existing. These shields were to protect the suspension of the vehicle which were pretty prone to damage considering the smaller road wheels and the fact that the torsion bar suspension was quite susceptible to damage. The T-64 never participated in combat truly apart from some large scale exercises such as the 1973 Dempa and was never exposed to any exportation to other countries. Between 1977 and 1980, a portion of these vehicles underwent an overhaul to bring them to the T-64 Alpha standard, post-1965 production vehicles, with the exception of the gun, although some sources disputed that. These overhauled T-64s are referred to as Object 432R, or T-64R. The older machines were phased out and scrapped. The T-64R remained in service until the, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, when most of them likely ended up in Ukraine. How many of these tanks remain is still quite unknown as various different models and configurations have been modified, chopped to pieces or just sent away to random places. The importance though of this vehicle for the Soviet war machine cannot however be overestimated. For all its drawbacks it was at the time of its introduction anyway a cutting edge design and relatively low number of them were produced only because it was very expensive and intended for core unit use only. The NATO units in Germany would face these tanks in case of an invasion in any direction, replacing the heavy tanks of an old Soviet elite unit with a more nimble, still powerful and still quite nimble main battle tank. Let's say to be very clear here that I'm not saying that the T-64 is the best tank of Soviet design ever made and that it is the greatest thing since sliced bread and that it could take out any NATO vehicle you could ever put against it. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is at the time on the drawing board and when you look at the facts and the figures, the T-64 was undoubtedly one of the most technologically superior tanks of its time. It really was stepping outside the bar of armor, in terms of speed, in terms of the way in which the engine was designed, making it more lightweight, and the gun itself being a little bit more powerful than its predecessors and the upcoming NATO threat from the 105mm rifled guns. I have to say that the T-64 is one of those tanks that unfortunately others I missed identify all the time and I assume it's tank gender, I have to be careful because it's hard to really push this against a T-72 because a T-72 is totally out of its league and in a different realm to this tank considering its time. In the 60s this was a tank that really had to be contended with and I do have a lot of respect for it and I hope you do too. Folks, thank you so much for joining me on today's video. I really do appreciate you stopping by. Once again, please stay safe, look after yourselves. If you did enjoy today's video, please hit that little like button and also make sure if you want to be notified of any upcoming content in the future that you hit the little bell by the subscribe button so you can be notified of any upcoming content as YouTube really is kind of kicking my butt right now and have no real interest in promoting my content even to my own subscribers. So I would appreciate if you could share these kind of videos, uh, click that little bell button to be notified so that I can actually get my content to you guys. For those of you who have been supporting and donating towards my Patreon funding page, I really cannot thank you enough. Really though, it does mean so much, especially at times like this. I would encourage you all though to please focus on yourself and your families right now. Uh, this is difficult times and you know, a random YouTuber and his Patreon page is definitely not where you need to be focusing your attention, but just something to consider uh, when you're you know, going on to sort of super chat and live streams and donating and Patreon and things like that to, to look after yourself first and those around you. So um, thank you all for joining me. If you have any other interest in any of my content or links and descriptions, 
uh, that are in the box below. You're more than welcome to. Go check them out. And I'll see you again next time, folks. All the best. Bye-bye.